Hi everyone, Claire here. Um, this lecture is going to be covering the first part of chapter 18, which is covering the cardiovascular system, specifically the heart, um, from your Marib text. I am still waiting on the results of my COVID test. It's Thursday right now. Um, but I figured I would just record this ahead of time. I'm hoping we're in class on Friday, tomorrow. Um, if not, this will be the lecture for tomorrow. But even if we are in class, um, I still think I'm going to plan on posting this. I guess if you're hearing it, um, you'll know if I did that or not. Um, just for, I guess, students, there's a lot of students who are also out sick um, who are going to be missing the lecture. And also because I think this information um, is kind of n important to be able to um, understand if you're going to move on um, in the rest of the heart chapter. So if anything's recorded um, for you guys to access later and rewatch and um, look at, I think this would be the lecture to do it. So it's actually, I think, going to work out okay. Um, a lot of what we're covering in this first part of the lecture is just um, like anatomy of the heart and blood flow through the heart, which you covered also in lab already. Um, but what I'm going to be doing is I have um, a PDF on our Educat page that's just like a blank heart. Um, and throughout this lecture, I'm going to be drawing in on that um, heart picture, um, labeling some stuff and kind of explaining different parts of the heart, how blood's moving. Um, so I posted that PDF for you guys if you want to print it out um, so you can kind of follow along and label this stuff. I think actually drawing through it and labeling it um, is a lot easier to understand um, than just, you know, sitting there and watching me talk about it. So if you want to do that, go ahead and do that now. Um, but we are going to get started. All right. So the first thing is this PDF um, that I wanted to kind of just review some stuff that hopefully you already know from lab, but it's really important moving forward. Um, so this is a heart, right? If this would be um, an anterior view that's cut in um, some sort of coronal or frontal plane. So you can see the inside and the chambers of the heart. Um, the heart we call a double pump because there's two sides of the heart. Um, so you say this over here is a side, this over here is a side. That's going to be pumping um, the blood to different areas. Because the first thing you want to look at um, is this bottom point down here. Okay, That bottom point is called the apex of the heart, and it's important because again, it's going to point to the left. Okay, see how it's kind of pointed this way? So we know that that's the left side, which makes that over there the right side of the heart. A lot of the names of these different structures are based on if they're right or left, so it's really important you get that down first. Okay, so the apex points to the left. Um, this bottom, this whole kind of like side here, which is kind of the bottom where it sits, that is called the base of the heart okay and then the other four things i just want to talk about real quick before we jump into this chapter um are the chambers so there's four chambers there are two atria which are going to be these chambers up top and then two ventricles which are these v-shaped chambers in the bottom i remember the ventricles are these ones because those v's look like v's <laughs> Okay, so they're named based on left to right. So up here we would have our left atrium. This on the other side would be our right atrium. And the bottom left ventricle. And then this side would be our right ventricle. Okay, so it's really important that at the very minimum you know that stuff. Um, so that we can um, understand how blood's going to be moving through this later on. Okay. All right. So, like I said, the the heart is a big pump. It's a double pump. It's going to be pumping blood um, to different areas of the body. And there's two circuits that we um, can talk about. So there is one circuit that is pumping blood to the lungs, which is called our pulmonary circuit. The other circuit is pumping blood to our body, and that's going to be our systemic circuit, okay? 
Um, and when we're talking about the heart, there's not really a good place to like start and finish, right? There's not like a starting point. You can follow it through ending point. Um, it depends on how it makes more, sen more sense to you to think about it. Okay. I like to think about starting at blood coming back from the systemic circuit. Okay, so in the systemic circuit, you're pumping blood to the body. In the last chapter, we talked about the main function of blood is carrying oxygen to the tissues, delivering the oxygen and nutrients, and then um, bringing carbon dioxide back to the lungs. So we know when blood is going to the systemic circuit, it's going to be oxygenated, right? That's why in this um, vessel there, it's red bringing oxygen to the tissues it drops off its oxygen at the tissues and then as it's going back to the heart leaving the tissues we have the deoxygenated blood okay that in my mind is always the easiest thing to remember coming back to the heart from the body our blood is deoxygenated okay um so we have deoxygenated blood coming back and that is going to go into the right atrium, okay? So you see blood is pooling into the right atrium from the systemic circuit. Okay. I'm going to kind of jump around here. From the right atrium, our blood is going to go into the right ventricle, okay? At that point, it's going to be kind of a part of the pulmonary circuit because our right ventricle is going to go and pump the blood, through to the pulmonary circuit okay so our right ventricle brings blood to the pulmonary circuit so our pulmonary circuit is um, bringing blood to and from the lungs okay and remember if you think about it intuitively the point of bringing blood to the lungs would be to get the co2 out of the blood and oxygen into the blood so blood going to the lungs is deoxygenated Okay, which makes the point of the lungs, again, is to oxygenate the blood. So then blood coming back would be oxygenated blood. And blood's going to come back into the heart, into the other receiving chamber, which would be the left atrium. So right here, left atrium. Okay, so left atrium receives blood returning from the pulmonary circuit. And then the last bit in our left ventricle then blood goes and then goes back out and leaves and goes to the systemic circuit. So our left ventricle pumps blood through the systemic circuit. Okay, so again, there's not really like a good way to think about this. You can think about it, you know, which, uh, which chambers receive blood would be the two atria. Um, the ventricles are the chambers that are pumping blood. You can think about it, which are the two systemic chambers, which are the two pulmonary chambers. Um, I think it's whatever makes more sense to you intuitively, intuitively to kind of think through it. Um, I think for this information, just memorizing, you know, right atria receives blood from the systemic circuit. I don't think memorizing that's helpful, right? If you can sit down and think about, okay, blood's coming back from the body into the right um, atria, then to the left vent right ventricle, out to the pulmonary circuit, and kind of talk through it that way. I think it will help you hum a lot better on um, the quizzes and exams. Okay, so if you have to, take a few minutes to go through this and kind of map it out in your head, draw it, whatever you need to do to kind of figure out um, the flow of heart through the body. Okay, and again, the main point of this slide, systemic circuit is to and from the body. So blood going to the systemic circuit would be oxygenated. Leaving would be deoxygenated. Pulmonary circuit is to and from the lungs. Going to the lungs would be deoxygenated. Leaving the lungs would be oxygenated. Okay. All right. In our body, this is just where our heart sits, which is pretty um, self-explanatory. So it is above your diaphragm here, right above the xiphoid process of your sternum. Um, and kind of below the second rib is where your heart starts. Again, the apex points to the left side of your body. Okay. 
Um, and then the base of the heart on the very bottom here kind of just sits on top of that diaphragm. Okay, so it would be behind or posterior to your sternum. Um, if you were to look at a transverse cut and look up, um, you could see the lungs kind of are on either side of the heart. They are more lateral. The heart is more medial with the sternum to the anterior side and vertebrae to the posterior side. Okay, you should all hopefully know where your heart is. Okay, so the membrane surrounding your heart. Um, we talked about this in 207, so this should kind of be mostly a review. But the pericardium is the double-walled sac that surrounds the heart, right? Remember, this is an example of a serous membrane. When we talked about serous membranes in 207, we talked about, think of it like so you stick your hand in a balloon, right? So you're, say this is a balloon <laughs> with your hand in there, <laughs> Okay. So when you stick your hand in the balloon, there is a portion of the balloon that directly touches your hand, and then a portion of the balloon that is further away. So those would be the two layers of your membrane, Okay, any serous membrane. So the layer that is touching your hand would be the visceral layer, think visceral for very close, and the layer that is further away would be the parietal layer. Okay. If it's around our heart, it's going to be, both of these are our pericardium. Okay. There's a few other terms now that you need to know as well, though. Um, around our heart, we also have what's called a fibrous pericardium. Okay. And it's going to be superficial to these serous membranes. So let's do the fibrous pericardium in blue here. I'll underline it. Our fibrous pericardium would be outside of both of these layers, more superficial, right? Because if our heart is where our hand is, okay, the visceral layer would be very close, parietal layer would be further away, and the fibrous layer would be on the furthest outside, okay? It helps just protect. Deep to that, we have two layers, right? Our parietal layer, which again would be that purple outer layer of the serous membrane. Between that, we would have our serous fluid, right? And then, whoops, on the inside would be our visceral pericardium, also in our heart known as the epicardium, okay? And that is the inner layer of the serous membrane, okay? The two layers are separated by a fluid-filled pericardial cavity, Okay, so that would be the space in the balloon, if you're thinking about the balloon, that has serious fluid that's going to decrease uh, friction around the heart. Okay, so there's an actual diagram here that shows it. Okay, again, these would be our serous membranes. Think again that double-walled sac. Um, one layer of that serous membrane is very close, would be visceral. The other layer further away would be the parietal pericardium, okay? Um, but they have some different names here. So this layer, again, would be the parietal pericardium, okay? That's the easiest one. Um, more superficial to that on the outside would be the fibrous pericardium, so this thick fibrous layer there. The space in between would be the pericardial cavity, and then the visceral pericardium would be this layer directly touching the heart. So visceral pericardium, and it's also known as the epicardium. Okay. Um, so that orange is kind of hard to see, but we'd have our epicardium or visceral pericardium directly touching the heart. Again, think visceral layer very close. Parietal pericardium further out. And then the fibrous pericardium, most superficially. Okay, not too bad. There's also layers of <coughs> um, the heart itself that you have to know. Okay, so the first one we already talked about, the epicardium. Remember, the visceral pericardium is the same thing as the epicardium. Okay. So epicardium or visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Okay. 
The next layer is our myocardium. And think myo, think muscle. So the myocardium is the muscular layer, um, which you should know is made up of cardiac muscle. Um, that's in the inside of our walls of our heart. And then the last layer of the heart itself is the endocardium. Okay, and the endocardium is going to be the innermost layer, so the layer that's lining the whole inside of the atria and the ventricles, the layer that blood is going to be coming in contact with. Okay, it's also um, continuous with the endothelial lining of blood vessels, so the layer of the inside of blood vessels will be, um, you know, continuous with that layer of the heart. Okay, so I expect you to know these layers, um, be able to label them or describe the um, relationship of them using directional terms. All right, um, so there's a bunch of other heart, <coughs> excuse me, a heart anatomy you guys are going to need to know. Um, so some of this I'm not going to go into detail about, um, but because you've done a lot of this in lab. So I'm not going to spend too much time. Um, you should be able to identify all of this stuff on here, as well as on here, which I understand is a lot, but that is just this class. Um, but there are a few things, especially like the major vessels, I want to kind of review with you. Okay, so these I'm just going to be layering, um, labeling the major vessels, and I'm going to color code them. Blue is going to be vessels that carry deoxygenated blood. And then the red, uh, that's not red, the red vessels are going to be carrying oxygenated blood, okay? And you should know the difference. Again, if you know where the blood is coming from, it makes sense if it's going to be oxygenated or deoxygenated, okay? And the other thing I want to review, which you should have learned in the lab from Zach, is that uh, the difference between veins and arteries, okay, which you should know, um, arteries are going to go away from the heart, Okay, which means veins are going to go towards. Okay, so that's just a general rule of thumb. Um, so if you're not sure if something's an artery or a vein, if you know which way blood's moving, then you can figure it out pretty easily. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, where blood is coming back from the systemic circuit. So remember, systemic circuit is bringing blood to the body. So the blood then coming ba back is going to be deoxygenated mm -hmm. and it's going to come back through these vessels here which would be our superior vena cava and our inferior vena cava okay so superior towards the top inferior towards the bottom both vena cava and they're going to be um, deoxygenated blood. So blood from our body comes back from those two vessels. Enters um, our right atrium. Remember, apex points to the left. All right, that points to the left. So just so you have it straight, I always write it down. Okay, so deoxygenated blood enters the right atria, goes down into the left ventricle, and then out through this big trunk here, which is the pulmonary trunk. And the name kind of tells you where it's going to be going. It's going to be going to the lungs. Pulmonary means lungs. The pulmonary trunk splits into these guys up top here, which are going to be pulmonary arteries. So this would be our left pulmonary arteries and our right pulmonary arteries. Okay. Again, if you can't remember, if something's an artery or vein, we're following the flow of blood. This blood's moving away from the heart, so it has to be an artery. Okay. So that's going to bring um, blood to our lungs. I'm just going to draw little lungs over here. <laughs> In the lungs, the whole point of the lungs is to oxygenate the blood. So in the lungs, blood becomes oxygenated, then will return to the heart, right? Through these vessels down here, okay? Which would, this side would be our left. This again is pulmonary. But in this case, it's vein, because it's coming back to the heart. And this would be our right pulmonary 
veins, these guys up here, okay? The pulmonary, <coughs> oh my gosh, sorry. The pulmonary veins are gonna drain the blood into our left atrium. That blood is gonna go down into our left ventricle and then out through this big loop-de guy here, which is our aorta, which is gonna bring blood We'll talk about specifics later, but to the head and then to the rest of the body, arms, legs, everywhere. And then the whole thing starts again, right? After all the blood goes to where it needs to go in the body, drops off its oxygen, we have deoxygenated blood again coming back in, moving through, out to the lungs, getting oxygenated, coming back in from the lungs, into our heart, back out to the aorta, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so these are the major vessels you're going to have to know of the heart arteries are always going to be going away veins are going to be moving towards the heart okay um most of our arteries are going to be branched off of our aorta okay remember aorta um technically is a great vessel but it's an artery bringing um, oxygenated blood away from the heart that's going to branch off into a bunch of different arteries going all over in our body, bringing oxygenated blood to our tissues. So the majority of arteries are going to be oxygenated blood. The only arteries in our body that aren't oxygenated blood are our pulmonary arteries going to our lungs. Okay, Every other artery will be oxygenated. And then the opposite thing goes for veins. After um, our blood in every area of our body, our fingertips, toes, everywhere, drops off its oxygen, the veins coming back to the heart are going to be deoxygenated. All of those veins are going to merge into the superior and inferior vena cava, and it's a lot of veins. So the majority of veins are going to be deoxygenated, with one exception, and that's the pulmonary veins. Okay, so when we start learning about all of the vessels, different, the brachial, radial, um, jugular, carotid, ulnar, tibial, fibular, all those different veins and arteries in the rest of our body, um, if it's part of the systemic circuit, arteries are going to be oxygenated blood, veins are going to be deoxygenated blood, Okay. Um, the only time that's going to be flip-flopped is in the pulmonary circuit where you'll see the opposite. Okay. I skipped over something really important just because there's some slides on it and I wanted to make sure we talk about them before I include them. Um, and that is heart valves. Okay. So we've already talked about these in labs. Um, but your heart valves are really important because they ensure unidirectional blood flow through the heart. Okay. Our heart is a pump. And we need blood to be pumped into the right direction to make sure that blood's going to where it needs to go to either drop off oxygen or pick up oxygen, okay? So the valves as well allow this to happen. They open and close in response to different pressure changes, okay? So as our heart is pumping and squeezing, that squeezing is going to create pressure in our um, blood, and that's going to close or open certain valves at different times, Okay, there's two main valves. This should be a review, but the atrioventricular valves, or also known as these are known as AV valves, are between the atria and ventricles. Self-explanatory. Um, and then the other type of valves are the semilunar valves. I'll abbreviate those as SL valves. And those are between the, the ventricles and the major um, arteries leaving the heart. The great vessels is what we call them. Okay, um, this is just a diagram from like above a weird section showing them. Um, I'm never going to ask you to label them here because it is quite confusing. Okay, but the, the more information on the valves. So the atrioventricular AV valves, um, again, are between the atria and ventricles. And they're going to prevent backflow into the atria when the ventricles contract. Okay, which... Um, I'll show you on the next slide. I'll just talk through this first. Um, so there's two of them, right? There's one on the right side called the tricuspid valve. It's called that because there's three cusps, tri, 
Um, it's between the right atria and right ventricle. The mitral, or I usually call it bicuspid, is the left AV valve. Um, and again, it's named because it has two of these little cusps. It's on the left side of the heart between the left atria and left ventricle. With each um, of these AV valves, you'll see associated chordae tendinae um, and these papillary muscles that they're attached to. Okay, um, So these valves are going to have, so say this is the bicuspid valve. I'm not even going to try to draw this. You know, I'm going to go back really quick and show you right there. If this is the right side, this would be your tricuspid valve. So there's three cusps, kind of hard to see. These little stringy boys are the chordae tendinae, and they're attached to these papillary muscles down here. Okay, right? Your bicuspid on the left side has that as well, the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles. And I remember which is on which side, because I think like the heart sound is makes like a lub, dub, right? And I just think lub, L-U-B, I think left bicuspid. Okay, so I think lub, LB, left bicuspid. Okay, um, so that's the valves. The, again, the papillary muscles are going to hold the, val the flaps closed um, and prevent the flaps from um, inverting back into the atria. So I'll show you that in the next slide here. So basically, if you're following blood flow, as blood comes into the atria, it's going into the atria. As blood goes into the atria, it's going to just passively move down into the ventricles, right? Those valves are going to be open in a relaxed state. So blood goes into the atria, slowly fills down into the ventricles, and those flaps are just going to be hanging open, right? So blood can flow. Red's not the best color for this. Hanging down so the blood can just flow on in, right? Eventually, your atria are going to contract, pushing the rest of your blood into the ventricles, okay? And these valves are still going to stay open. And this is because atrial pressure is greater than ventricular pressure, right? If your atria are contracting or blood is flowing into the atria, there's a lot of pressure in the atria pushing the blood into the ventricles, so these flaps are going to stay open, okay? Once all the blood is in the ventricles, down here you can see it, your ventricles are going to start to contract. When those ventricles contract, the pressure in the ventricles are going to increase, causing those flaps to close off. Okay, so you can see now these flaps create a closed position. So blood does not go back into the atria. All right, it stays in the ventricles. Um, and again, that's why these papillary muscles and the chordae tendinae are so important because as that pressure increases in the ventricles, it's going to want to be pushed back into the atria, but these papillary muscles anchor this flap down so that the, the flaps don't go out the other way, okay? And that's the AV valves. Pretty easy, okay? Again, we also have semilunar valves, SL, um, between the ventricles and the major arteries or the great vessels. They're going to open and close in response to pressure changes as well. Um, and they're called semilunar because the valves look kind of like a half moon, but that's where their name came from. Okay, so they're named based on the great vessel they're going into. Um, so the pulmonary semilunar is between the right ventricle and pulmonary trunk. Aortic semilunar is between the left ventricle and aorta. Okay, those ones are pretty easy. <clears throat> How these guys work. Okay, so in the last one we talked about blood's coming into the atria, passively moving into the ventricles, blah, blah, blah. Once the ventricles start to contract, AV valves close. So blood can't go back into the atria. Once pressure is great enough in the ventricles, the semilunar valves are going to open and blood are going to leave the ventricles through the semilunar valves. Okay, so once um, intraventricular pressure rises, blood is pushed against semilunar valves, forcing them open. Okay, and that's why it's so important 
<coughs> that these AV valves close. Because if the AV valves didn't close, the blood would simply just go back into the atria and never get enough pressure to push out of those semilunar valves. Okay. And then as the ventricles relax and the intraventricular pressure falls, um, blood flowing back from the arteries kind of fills up these cusps here and it has more pressure now. Now pressure is kind of pushing back in this way, but these cusps of the semilunar valves keep pressure from going back into the ventricles. So you can see we don't have blood going back into either of the ventricles. Okay, and that's because the great vessel pressure up here is greater than the um, pressure in the ventricles. Okay, so that's the semilunar valves. Okay, so I didn't draw those on the last um, slide, so I'm going to draw them in again. So we'll talk through, um, I guess, blood flow and include this. So blood comes in deoxygenated from the systemic circuit. Again, you should be able to walk me through this. And if you can walk me through this, you can answer any question about this. Um, through the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium. From there, it moves through that first valve here, which is going to be the tricuspid valve or right a V valve. Okay. Blood then is pumped, squeezed out through the next valve, this guy, which is the pulmonary semi lunar. All right. Pumped into the pulmonary trunk, goes out the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. <laughs> gets oxygenated, comes back through the pulmonary veins into the left atria, through the next valve, which would be our bicuspid, or left AV. So that oxygenated blood goes into the left ventricle, is pumped out through the next one, which is our aortic semilunar into the aorta and out to the body. All right, so four valves you have to know. Um, if you can walk me through just like I did and again explain step by step where blood is coming from, what vessels it's going through, which valves it's going through, how it's being pumped out, um, then you should be good on um, the quiz for this part at least. Okay. Um, the next few slides for this part are just going through the pathway of blood through the heart, which in my last slides I um, kind of explained as I drew through it. Um, I think it makes more sense to me to kind of draw through it and explain it, you know, rather than just a list of structures. But some people might like this list, so I included this as well. Um, I don't think I could just sit here and, like, name everything in order without like looking at a diagram and kind of drawing it out. Um, so don't expect to have like all of this memorized without um, a blank heart in front of you, right? If there's a heart in front of you, you can walk through it and talk me through the names of this stuff, then I think, um, again, you should be good. But through the right side of the heart, um, again, comes in your superior and inferior vena cava to your right atrium through the tricuspid, to your right ventricle, through the pulmonary semilunar valve, through the uh, pulmonary trunk, to the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs. Oh, this, <laughs> this literally shows what I was just drawing dots on. Okay, so that's a pathway on the right side. Left side is going to be then the opposite. Um, so blood comes, um, well, it starts down here, from the pulmonary veins comes in into the left atrium through the bicuspid or mitral valve to the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar through the aorta to the rest of the body. Okay. So, um, 
here all that is together and it's going to kind of like go in a loop here so again whatever way where you want to start whatever makes most sense to you um, as long as you can kind of talk me through step by step what's happening you guys should be good okay um, and then the last part oh there's two more slides actually um, so one thing I want to mention too is that um, you have equal volumes of blood being pumped to both the pulmonary and systemic circuits. Okay, and it's really important that you know this. Um, the equal of volumes allows your body to ensure that there's no buildup of blood anywhere. Okay, if you didn't have equal volumes being pumped when the heart pumps um, each time, um, then there would be like a pooling or a buildup of blood in one area of your body, which obviously would not be good. Okay, so... Um, if you have a valve that doesn't work properly or one chamber of your heart isn't pumping as effectively as it should and you don't pump um, equal volumes, that is basically like what is happening during a heart attack. Uh, and you're going to end up with fluid buildup or blood buildup in different areas, um, which leads to a lot of different issues. Okay, um, So the equal volumes <coughs> in pulmonary and systemic, but... Um, there is a difference on pressure, okay? So the force of the, each pump. So the pulmonary circuit is just going to be to and from the lungs. So it's a very short distance blood is traveling. Um, it's going to be, oops, a very low pressure circulation, okay? It doesn't take much for your heart to just pump blood to the lungs. They're right there. So the pump is not going to be as intense, as high pressure. Your systemic circuit to and from your body is a very long distance, um, and it's going to be a high friction um, and high, excuse me, high pressure circulation. Your heart is going to need to pump a lot harder to get blood from all the way from your heart to your head, to the tips of your fingers, tips of your toes. So the systemic circuit is going to require a lot greater force of pumping than your pulmonary. Okay, and the ventricles, the anatomy of them, reflect the differences. So you can see, if we zoom in on the heart, if we cut that open, these two little gaps here are the ventricles. On the left side of the heart, look how thick that myocardium is. That layer of muscle is really thick because the left side of the heart, remember, is what's going to be pumping blood through the aorta to the rest of the body through the systemic circuit. So it needs a lot of muscle, a lot of pressure to pump that. Compared to the right side of the heart, which is just pumping blood through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs, um, doesn't need much pressure. So you're going to have a lot thinner um, layer of myocardium in the um, right ventricle. Okay, And then the last circuit we're going to talk about um, is the coronary circulation. Um, <coughs> coronary circulation um, is just the circulation that brings blood to the heart muscle itself. Right? All of our tissues are going to need oxygen, nutrients, etc. to perform their functions. The heart is no different. So your heart has its own circulation um, to get the things that it needs. I'm going to call that the coronary circulation, okay? So it's the shortest circulation in the body, right? Just to and from the heart, from the heart. Um, it's delivered mostly when the heart is relaxed. Um, and the left ventricle is going to receive most of the coronary blood supply, which makes sense because remember the left ventricle is what's going to be doing that major pumping, getting blood to the systemic circuit. Okay, so you have coronary arteries going away from the heart, bring oxygenated blood to the tissues. Um, they branch off the base, if you can kind of see, of the aorta here, the major coronary arteries left and right that are going to split then into some smaller ones. Um, you need to know those for lab. I'm not worried about them for lecture. Once your blood, um, your oxygen is delivered to the tissue, the deoxygenated blood is going to um, return through the cardiac veins. There's a few different ones. The cardiac veins, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm dying, all um, drain into the coronary sinus, 
which is on the posterior side of the heart. And that is going to drain right back into the right atrium, right? So deoxygenated blood into the right atrium, the same place the superior and inferior vena cava drain into. Okay. Okay, you'll have to know the specific names in um, lab again, but lecture, I'm not too worried about those. All right. That's it for the anatomy um, for the heart. The next few sections are going to be kind of intense talking about physiology of heart. So we'll talk about um, the cardiac muscle physiology. And to do that, you might need to go back and review information from chapter 9 from 207. Okay, so these questions are just an example of some things you should already know. Um, if you don't know the answer to these or don't know at all what this is talking about, it's going to be a really good idea for you to go back and review um, information from chapter 9. Okay, a lot of the information for the um, cardiac muscle physiology is similar to the um, skeletal muscle physiology in many ways. Um, there's a different in a few ways, but I'm going to lecture with the, um, I guess, knowledge that you guys with the expectation better that you guys have the knowledge from chapter nine still okay you need to know this information if not what i'll talk about in the next lecture is not going to make any sense okay so if you need to go review chapter nine do that um i taught 207 this summer and recorded all of my lectures they're on youtube um so if you're interested in watching my lecture from the summer session about um, muscle physiology, skeletal muscle physiology. Um, I'll probably post the link to that on our EDUCAT page um, if you're interested in taking a look at that, okay? If you have any questions, let me know. Bye.